Hello there, this is Dr. DeMaio, and we are here on the cardiovascular system, heart one. Uh, there'll be more than one of uh, these. This is the first one in the heart. And if you look at this picture, we're talking about the heart. This shows you a, uh, a section of the heart from inside the heart. You can see the right and left atrium, right and left ventricle, separated by the valves, the interventricular valves. On the right is the tricuspid, has three cusps. I always remember tri. Uh, when you do a rugby um, touchdown, we call it a tri, and right is tri. That's how I remember it. And on the left side is the bicuspid valve, otherwise known as the mitral valve. And we'll go through all this anatomy later. You're looking at this nice EKG here, and you see two people getting fit. Our heart is a gigantic muscle, and it needs to stay fit. Okay, so the heart is a four-chambered uh, structure. It's a four-chambered muscular pump. has four chambers, two at the top, two at the bottom. It's approximately the size of your fist, and it sits in the superior aspect of the um, thoracic cavity, and it's a little bit to the left. It's on top of the superior aspect of the diaphragm, is what I was trying to say. It's left to the midline anterior to the vertebral column, but posterior to the sternum. Okay, the two content layout, this is not supposed to be in here, this slide. We're just going to ignore that slide. I don't know how that got in there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the heart position, it just shows you the heart position. And you can see how the heart is sitting slightly to the left here, right? This is the apex of the heart. See, they call that the apex. And this is the base of the heart up here, and I'm calling this the base. And it's below the sternum. And you're going to see as we go through the little more of the anatomy where we have these coverings of the heart, and you have a fibrous pericardium. And the fibrous pericardium, if we opened up the heart like we just looked at that picture, you wouldn't see the heart right away. You'd see this big fibrous connective tissue over it. Then it has its typical membranes like an organ does. It has a serous pericardium surrounding the cavity, the pericardial cavity, made up of squamous epithelium. And it's a simple squamous epithelium because it's a serous pericardium. You know, whenever it's a serous uh, layer, it's got to be made up of simple squamous epithelium. And simple squamous epithelium produces a serous fluid that helps to lubricate and allow things to move within their space. Then there's a cavity between the actual heart itself, and so you have a, a serous pericardium and then a serous uh, visceral layer, or epicardium. So a pericardium is a serous layer around the entire cavity, okay? And then you have a, a membrane around the top of the heart called the epicardium, which is a serous uh, layer of a pericardium. It's not the parietal layer. You have a parietal layer surrounding the parietum. Uh, so like if you're sitting inside a cavity of something and you took your hands and you rubbed them around the side of it, like you're inside a box and you're rubbing the box from inside out, that's your peri, uh, parietal layer. So you're sitting in a parietal layer like the inside of a box and then yourself touch your skin Rub your skin right now, and you're on the visceral layer, in a sense, if you were an organ, right? And that's called, in this case, we call it the visceral pericardium, or it's on another name for it is the epicardium. And then the next layer is the myocardium, which is all the muscle, thick muscle wall. That's your myocardium. And then your endocardium, which is actually an endothelial layer of the same material that form this, and this, what form? It's a serous layer, serous layer, another serous layer, which is continuous with the inside of the heart chambers. And that layer, by the way, the endocardium continues as it extends out, it changes its name, it becomes the endothelial layer of your blood vessels. Okay? All right. So the pericardium is a doubled wall sac around the heart. Pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. 
And uh, myocarditis is inflammation of the myocardium. Several uh, young people are getting this right now after the vaccine, but also from COVID too. My, uh, my, my nephew, who's swimming, was trying out for the Olympic trials. Uh, his name is um, Benjamin Kano. He uh, had myocarditis from uh, COVID last year. And it's amazing that he was actually able to swim in the trials. And he almost made it. He's probably going to make the national team. But if he didn't have the myocarditis, I'm sure he probably would have made the team this year, uh, the Olympic team. Anyhow, you have this layers. You have these layers. You have, a, And you can get pericarditis. That would be inflammation within the sac where the heart sits. That's different than myocarditis. But it's probably the same cause, like some sort of infection. And you can have that swelling inside that chamber, and that would put pressure on your chest. If you had too much fluid in the sac, it pushes down on the chest, and it feels like someone's sitting on your chest. And that's called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. T-A-M-P-A-N-D-A-D-E. That's when you have pressure on the chest from pericarditis. Myocarditis is inflammation of the actual heart muscle, myocarditis. Okay, so in the pericardium, we have the superficial fibrous pericardium we talked about. And then there's two layers. There's the parietal layer of the fibrous pericardium. And then there's the visceral layer. Now, this should be changed. It's the parietal, uh, not the fibrous. Let's cross this out. So you have the, the fibrous layers on the outside. That's the superficial fibrous pericardium. And this is going to be the parietal layer that lines the entire surface of the, of the pericardium. This is a serous, S-E-R-O-U-S. That's a serous layer. I can't, I'm not good with a mouse here. Give me a break. All right. All right. So it's a serous layer. Just don't confuse that. I made a mistake. They were typing that fibrous. And then there's a visceral layer of the pericardium, which is also known as the epicardium. And they're separated by fluid between these two. And that fluid is the pericardial fluid. And it has very specific functions of the pericardial fluid. It helps to dissipate heat. Remember, the heart's beating 70 to 100 and something beats per minute, an average person, if they exercise a little bit, um, all day long, right? 365 days a year, how many years of your life, you know, it's going to warm up a little bit in there and you need lubrication. So it helps to lubricate. It protects and cushions the heart. And like I said, if there's too much fluid, that cushion could press down on the heart and cause cardiac pan tamponade. And that would be associated with pericarditis, right? And then there's an exchange of uh, fluid. You can have an exchange with a small amount of ions, lactic acid in there. And you need those exchange because the heart needs to have those ions to function. As a matter of fact, if you took a beating heart out of an animal or a human being and you put it in the bath with the right amount of ions, the heart will keep beating as long as the connective tissue stays healthy. Of course, it can't stay healthy with proper blood supply and you can't increase the rate or decrease the rate of that heart, but it has a pacemaker and it will keep beating so, uh, providing it's in those ions. Okay, so the epicardium, again, is also known as the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. The myocardium is the cardiac muscle layer. It forms the bulk of the heart. There's a fibrous skeleton of the heart that's crisscrossing, interlacing layer of connective tissue, keeping it together as a, as a, a whole unit. And then the endocardium is the endothelial layer of the heart, and that's actually inside the chambers of the heart, right? So the heart is mostly muscle, like I said, that's called the myocardium. And the arrangement of the muscle in the intercalated disc allow for 100% recruitment of cardiac muscle cells. Now, within the atria and the ventricles as well. When one muscle cell is stimulated within each of those units, so let's talk about the atrium for a moment. So when one muscle in the atrium is stimulated by the sinoatrial node, it doesn't act alone. It quickly spreads throughout the entire atria. 
This will be followed by a slight delay, and then it goes to the next one below the atrium into the uh, ventricle region to the AV node. This is the electrical signal. And then the entire in ventric ventricular muscles will contract. The cells are branched and have intercalated discs that form electrical synapses with each other. And this allows for a uniformed contraction of the muscle stimulated. And we'll see, we call that a functional syncytium when it works like that. So let's look at this general anatomy of the heart. You're looking at the inside of the heart. Here's the atrium. And here's the ventricles here, separated by connective tissue above and below and valves. And then the right and left is separated as well. And we did this anatomy already in the lab. So the atria are the receiving chambers of the heart. Each atrium has a protruding auricle. It's like an ear. It's like an a ear on top of the atrium. And that auricle uh, is used as a reservoir. The blood enters the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus. The blood enters that um, the left atria from the pulmonary veins. So you have two types of blood coming to the atria. One to the right is deoxygenated blood, and the one to the left is being oxygenated blood, but notice we call it a pulmonary vein, but it is oxygenated. Pulmonary veins have oxygen coming from the lungs, right? Whereas the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus going to the right atrium are deoxygenated blood. Then inside the atria, let's talk about the atria first, there's something called pectinate muscles. Each pectinate muscle, when contracting, creates a fold or a ridge that directs the flow of blood to the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. So actually, the muscular wall of the atria can actually, when it contracts, it wrinkles, kind of like if you took a piece of paper and you're, like you're making an airplane, but you're folding it like just all along the long edge, and you make this like accordion-type structure and then you funneled it into a hole or cup. You know, you can use that as a funnel, and I could show you when we do an actual live thing, we'll talk about that. And the blood flows from the atria to the ventricles and helps to guide it. These pectinate muscles help to create ridges when they contract to guide it through the two valves down. Right is the tricuspid from the right atrium to the right ventricle, Left is the bicuspid or mitral valve from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Ventricles are the discharging chambers of the heart. The right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary trunk. Okay, so now we're talking about the ventricles, and it's going to be directing that blood pumping up from the bottom to the pulmonary trunk. The left ventricle pumps blood into the aorta from the bottom up, and they have this thing called the papillary muscles and the trabecular carnae. And these mar muscles are marking or what the ventricular walls look like. They create folds, again, that channel blood up through the pulmonary and the uh, aortic valves. So it pumps up through the pulmonary semilunar valve on the right side and out from the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and from the left ventricle out through the aortic semilunar valve that leads into the ascending aorta. So again, you have these papillary muscles, we'll talk about their job, and the trabecular, uh, they function to help do that. Now the pathway of blood through the heart and lungs, uh, you have this image here, and this is the right side of the heart in blue, and this is the left side of the heart in red, and this is supposed to represent deoxygenated blood. So the deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium, to the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. Then in the lungs, the capillaries within the lungs are picking up the oxygen from the breathed in oxygen, and then they go to the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, into the right left ventricle, and up through the aorta, and through the aorta to the rest of the body. So again, this is the pathway of blood through the heart, right atrium, right tricuspid valve, right ventricle, right ventricle to pulmonary semilunar valve, pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Lungs, 
back to the pulmonary veins, to the left atrium, left atrium through the bicuspid valve, left ventricle, left ventricle to the aortic semilunar valve, and the aorta to the systemic circulation. So this is the external heart, looking at the anatomy of the external heart. Um, we can go through this again if you like, or you could just review this on your own. But basically, this is the right atrium, and it has oracles on top. It doesn't really show you the oracles very well, but this would be the oracle portion, like a pouch. And then the left has the same thing. The left atrium would have oracles on it as well. Superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, ascending aorta, aortic arch, and the, and the first branch going to the right, like we talked about yesterday uh, in our lab. This is the right brachiocephalic, it's the only brachiocephalic artery coming off the aortic arch. It's the first branch off the aortic, aortic arch to bring the blood to the right side of the uh, body. And then the left side doesn't need a brachiocephalic, it goes right, correct, just goes directly to the left common carotid. And this is the left subclavian aortic arch. Coming down would be the descending aorta, which you can't see here. This is the ligamentum arteriosum, which is a remnant of a, a connection between both circulation and the infant and the womb. And then these are the pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. It's very, very important as you look at this anterior anatomy of the heart, you don't get confused that this is going into the right side because it's not. These four pulmonary veins are coming from the lungs into the, and they go into the left atrium posteriorly. So make sure you realize that because you're looking at a two-dimensional image. If you turned it, you would see that these are going into the left atrium. And of course, it's the left ventricle. This would be the apex of the heart, the left ventricle on the left side, right ventricle on the right side. Then you have your, your coronary arteries and veins. So here you have a, uh, and this, this demonstrates the oracle a little bit, as they called it oracle there, of the atrium. So you have coming in here, you have this, uh, left coronary artery that branches off into a circumflex artery that wraps around circumflexively, whatever way you want to say it. And this is the anterior interventricular artery on the left, left anterior ventricular artery. On the right, this is the right coronary artery right here. Okay, in the right anterior ventricular groove. And then you have these different branches. You have branches of the major, uh, smaller arteries. Uh, but these would be the major ones we want you to know. This one, this one, and this one, correct? Okay. Let's go to our next slide. So the vessels returning to the heart include the superior and inferior vena cava into the right, and then you have the right and left pulmonary veins. I'm sorry. The superior inferior vena cava on the right, and then the left goes into the pulmonary veins. Uh, pulmonary veins comes into the left side of the heart. The vessels conveying blood away from the heart include the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta. And we know... Okay, so that was just a review. You see the notes, I already published them for you. This is the posterior of the heart, and this shows you, on this one, you can see uh, the apex of the heart on the left here, okay? And here's the four pulmonary veins coming into the left atrium. And here's the inferior vena cava coming into the right atrium, superior vena cava coming into the right atrium, and then here's the coronary sinus going into the right atrium. And this is going to be um, the great cardiac vein that forms at the end of it becomes a coronary sinus. And then uh, this is the posterior vein of the ventricle and left and posterior vein of the right ventricle here. And here you see the right coronary artery coming around and the circumflex artery coming around this way on the left. So the coronary circulation is the functional blood supply to the heart muscle itself. Look, it's beating all day long. It needs lots of oxygen, so it needs lots of blood supply. The collateral roots make sure you get a good blood delivery to the heart, even if there's a major vessel occlusion. 
coronary circulation, the arterial supply, again, it's going through those arteries again. I'd like you to review this. Take your time, go through this instead of me doing the Charlie Brown thing here. Okay. And then here are your veins. You're going to review that as well. So let's talk about the heart valves for a minute. And the heart valves ensure a unidirectional blood flow through the heart. You have the AV valves. Those are the valves or atrioventricular valves. They lie between the atria and the ventricles, and they bring blood from the atria down through the ventricles. But also, the AV valves prevent backflow when the ventricles contract. The ventricles contract with a stronger contraction, a lot more muscles, especially on the left side, and they have the possibility of blowing the valve's cusps, they call them bicuspid and tricuspid valve, because they're like flaps. And these flaps can blow up like a parachute through, and that would be a problem. So we have a mechanism to protect that and keep that from happening. And we have these things called the chordate tendinate, which are like parachute um, cords. And you have, they anchor to these muscles called the papillary muscles. So that when the, the muscles contract in the ventricles, the papillary muscles contract as well, and they can keep it firm so that the... It's like you're holding the parachute with your hands, you're holding it firmly, and it, it helps to keep it from blowing up through. So here you see the heart valves, you see a right atrium with a right tricuspid valve, and you see these things called chordae tendinae. See that? Coming off, and these are your papillary muscles. Here's the left atrium with a, bi a bicuspid or mitral valve, with its chordae tendinae coming down. These are the chordae tendinae here. And these are the papillary muscles here. And if you look at this arrangement of the trabecular of the heart, it would actually guide the blood flow up through here. This is the aortic semilunar valve. It's hard to see it, which is gonna direct the flow of blood up. And this is the pulmonary semilunar valve, which is direct the flow up this way. So the aortic valve lies between the left ventricle and the aorta. The pulmonary semilunar valve lies between the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And the semilunar valves can help prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles as well. They close after the blood pumps up. And that's part of the sounds you hear during your, your heart sounds. The microscopic anatomy of the heart, the cardiac muscle, we know is a striated, short, fat, branched, and interconnected. They have connective tissue uh, called the endomycium that acts as both as a tendon and an insertion. And there's the intercalated discs that anchor the cardiac cells together, but function to allow ions passing through because of the many, many, many connexons. And if you remember in uh, muscle anatomy we did last year, last semester, connexons are a way of connecting the cardiac muscles together by um, these tubules, protein tubules that allow ions to flow through. They're ion channels. And I call them doot-de-doos. <laughs> and a doot-de-doo is kind of like the end of a paper towel roll, you know, and you take it to your mouth and you run around the house, you go, do, do, do. that's what a doot to do is. So when you look at a connexon, it has these many, many ion channels there. So literally, if you look at the wall of your room you're in, imagine the next room next to you has, um, is a cardiac muscle cell and you're a cardiac muscle cell there, that the entire wall is lined with holes in it, with doot to do's in it. And you could throw candy to your brother in the other room or what have you, right? And that's, uh, that's how it works. So here again, you see these uh, intercalated discs connecting each cell to each other. You know, uh, when we look at the cardiac muscle cell at rest, it measures about nine, minus 90 millivolts. Minus at rest, cardiac muscle cell at rest is going to be how much? Write it down. Minus 90 millivolts. Minus 90 Whoa, I'm not very good at drawing millivolts. And when your cardiac muscle depolarizes, it goes to plus 20. 
during depolarization, it goes to plus 20 millivolts. And that's important as we look at the cardiac uh, EKG. You have a flat line called the isoelectric line. That's nothing's happening. And then you get your P wave. And the P wave will be the depolarization of the atria. And then your QRS wave is associated with the depolarization of the ventricles. And then your T wave is the repolarization. And then we'll talk about atria systole and ventricular systole later. Okay, we're going to go through all this.